Coming up on One Central Florida, an extreme obstacle race series designed by Navy SEALs challenges athletes across the nation. And this Apopka woman is one of the sport's top competitors. I think everybody needs to have a little adventure in life. It keeps you young, it keeps you happy. Then, Central Floridians experience the freedom and exhilaration of a wild ride on the state's coastal winds. It's like three-dimensional compared to windsurfing. You've got a lot more freedom. You're closer to the water even than a windsurfer. Plus, badminton is big in Orlando, but it's not the backyard game you may remember. And professional arm wrestlers battle it out near Ormond Beach. Meet some of the local competitors. Share some of the secrets of arm-to-arm -arm combat. All that and more on this Get Active edition of One Central Florida. Battle Frog, a nationwide series of races over an extreme obstacle course designed by Navy SEALs. Central Floridian Ashley Samples is one of the circuit's top female competitors. She entered her first race at the suggestion of some work friends. I started training and then come race day, all of my coworkers decided not to show up. So I ran it by myself and then was hooked ever since. By day, I'm a financial analyst, so I sit at a desk for eight hours, so this is kind of my escape from that. I'm a super competitive person. I could compete over who could eat breakfast the fastest. When you come out here, you never know who's gonna be here, and that's part of the excitement. Being up against the best people in the world and being able to put up a fight. And the idea was to take some of the values of the Navy SEAL training concept and their discipline and their whole concept of overcoming obstacles in life and take those core values and then take them across communities all around the country. In 2015, the national circuit included 15 races. The Battle Frog Finals are being held at Rock Springs State Park in Lake County because of the warm weather in Central Florida and its reputation as a top travel destination. During the entire year, elite athletes have been accumulating points based on their standings and where they come in. At this celebration, we take all of our top elite athletes and the top 30 in each category. This is where they fight it out to decide who's the number one in the world. Ashley stands in fifth place among women. She's trained hard for this last race, sometimes with her boyfriend Dustin, also a top competitor. I think we're gonna see a very competitive field. Everybody has a lot on the line. Not only is there cash prizes for the overall winner, but there's cash prizes for the point series. And as a competitor, you know, you're up against the best. It's mid-December in Central Florida, and time for the big final race. There was a pre-race briefing for all the elite athletes where they explain how to do all the obstacles, what's permitted, what's not allowed. That way, going into race day, you know what to expect, and you know the rules that everybody's expected to adhere by. When you're on a green, that means you should be switching your feet. Yeah. We're allowed to go look at all the obstacles, analyze how to approach them, but we're not allowed to touch anything. That's a big, that's a big span. This is the last race of the season. This is it. Do yourself proud. Do this sport proud. You gotta live it. One by one. There are different series of walls you have to climb from a four foot, six foot, eight foot. They do rope climbs. They do rope wall climbs. There's cargo net climbs. There are platinum rig, which is a series of different upper body obstacles from rings, ropes, nunchucks. There's a rec bag carry, which is a 50 pound bag you have to wear over your shoulders and carry throughout other obstacles. Of course, there's natural obstacles such as water, mud pits, hills, sand. 
Right there, Ashley. At the halfway point, Come she on, slips here. off the wet platinum rig obstacle and has to go back to the start. My arms are tired. So, best thing to do in this case is rest it out until you can get some of your feeling back and then make another go at it. So. After 15 minutes, Ashley's ready to take another shot at the obstacle. Nice job, Ashley. The race was brutal. It was a way tougher course than I think people expected. Even though the terrain was flat, the obstacles were tough, upper body intensive. Uh, they made you carry stuff, so your grip was burnt by the time you got to all the rigs. Competitors must complete the five-mile course twice. The platinum rig, once again, is Ashley's downfall. She falls halfway through and tries to recover. When you know you can do something, and your body won't physically cooperate, it's a really painful experience because your mind wants it so bad and, and you just can't pull it out. Dustin gives his support. He gave me words of encouragement, which is really important. He knows how to deal with me personally, so he can encourage me but be tough enough on me that I know he means business and I know what I need to do. After losing a critical 30 minutes, Ashley finally conquers the rig and finishes in 11th place. Worn out. It was good. It was hard. I've been challenged all day, so it's nice to be done. I'm very proud of her. It shows a lot of character to battle the way she just battled. It's uh. It's, it's hard. It's harder than it's harder than winning. I promise you. I'm very proud of you. The way today ended was not the ending I was hoping for, uh, but I put up a strong fight all season. I'll finish fifth in the point series, which was really important to me. I think everybody needs to have a little adventure in life. It keeps you young. It keeps you happy. Keeps you healthy. And I think that's the reason why a lot of people do this sport. And that's definitely why I do this sport. In its basis rawest form, you are using wind to power a big sail to pull you around and over the water. That is, in essence, kiteboarding. I've been kiteboarding in this area since 2005. This is where I discovered kiteboarding and, and just got hooked. I was sitting surfing one day and I would just sit there for hours and hours and catch one or two waves. And when I saw a guy come by with this big kite in the air and catch more waves than I could catch an entire summer, I said, okay, that's for me. Kiteboarding is the ultimate crossover sport. Anything that you do now, you can literally just throw a kite into it and enjoy it. And that's really what I like about kiteboarding, that you can adapt it to your personality and what you like to do. In 2010, Roman and friend Brett Zacker became partners in 321 Kiteboarding. It's not only a one-stop shop for all things kiteboarding, but also one of the largest kiteboarding schools in the area. Change the way the kite steers. Learning to kiteboard is actually very simple, but it's definitely not something I recommend going out on your own and trying to do, because it's those not so simple things that will get you into trouble. But really anybody can do this. If you can get up and walk around the block in the morning, you can come and learn how to kiteboard. Students learn the basics, how to set up the gear and how to use it safely. Then it's out to the water, where they learn how to harness the wind to propel themselves across the water. Now if it does that, we just wait, the kite will come back around. Now you can add a little tension, a little more tension, and steer the kite up towards 12 o'clock. So to your left. Very good. Biggest skills are just, uh, you know, a little bit of endurance because when you're learning, you're going to be out on the water for an hour or two at a time. Uh, but other than that, a lot of people think that you need a lot of upper body strength when you don't. You're connected to the kite with a harness, so the kite is actually handling a lot of the power and the pull for you. Your arms are simply steering the kite around. And then when it comes to the board sport, you just really need a little bit of leg strength, a little bit of core strength to keep your balance, and that's really it. So again, 
anyone can really do this sport all the way from a child to a senior. Anton Ganev is 65 years young and has been kiteboarding for about 17 years. I was windsurfing before and uh, anything new happens I always try it and I liked it better than windsurfing and I stopped windsurfing and I started to kite. It's like three-dimensional compared to windsurfing. You've got a lot more freedom. You're closer to the water even than a windsurfer. And you can go in a lighter wind. Uh, you can handle stronger wind without damaging your body. It's a lot of positive things, but I still love it compared to windsurfing. I haven't windsurfed for 15 years now. <laughs> People ask my age all the time, but to me, it's no difference between 20 years ago and now. Here you have the wind propels you, so you have constant bolt to pull you everywhere you want it, and you tell which direction to go. With its subtropical climate, extensive coasts, and thousands of inland waterways and lakes, Central Florida is an ideal locale for the sport. Cocoa Beach in general is probably one of the top spots in the United States. We're warm pretty much year round, but definitely October through May is gonna be the main kiting season because that's when we get a lot of our frontal driven winds from high pressure and cold fronts. So you're gonna have more consistent winds those times and we can kite in any wind direction here in Cocoa Beach. So you're never left wanting to kiteboard because no matter what the wind's doing, you're always gonna be greeted with warm wind, warm water, and you know any wind direction so you can ride just about anywhere. Getting into kiteboarding, you're gonna realize that it's one of the neatest community sports out there. A lot of people hearken it back to the 60s when surfing was just, you know, that golden era and everybody knew everyone. That's how kiteboarding is right now. You walk into any area that there's kiteboarders, they're gonna greet you with a smile, they're gonna help you out. Kiteboarding is often done on the calm waters of a bay area or lagoon. More adventurous kiteboarders prefer the ocean and riding the waves. Either way, there's only one requirement. Just about any time they swim, if they swim every day, I go every day. It's almost like doing yoga in the water. It's, uh, you calm so much after that. Uh, sometimes I'm driving as fast as I can to get to the site. Coming back, I'm driving 40 miles on a 60 mile zone. You're just completely relaxed, you know. Yeah, 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 really, uh, it's like a cure for me. I love kiteboarding just for the, the open feeling that you get. You're kind of connected, you're at one with nature, you're, you're literally letting nature pull you around. You get uh, just that sense of accomplishment, just being out on the water, your mind's kind of blank, you're in a real zen mood. But I personally just like being on the water, being active, so that's a huge part of, of kiteboarding for me. You couldn't really ask for more. Coming up on One Central Florida, a former Olympic athlete is bringing high-performance badminton to Orlando. Also, this Ormond Beach man says arm wrestling is a legitimate sport and lives the life to prove it. Belvin Perry Jr. is perhaps best known as the presiding judge in the Casey Anthony criminal trial, but his body of work and accolades go beyond the courtroom. Perry learned the value of public service from his father, who was one of the first African-American police officers on the Orlando Police Force, and his mother, who was a public school teacher. A graduate of Jones High School and Tuskegee University, Perry began his legal career in 1977, joining the state's attorney's office. He was first elected as a circuit judge in 1989 and served for nearly 25 years, including nine terms as Chief Judge of the Ninth Judicial Circuit. Perry also served by leading initiatives to address poverty, crime, the plight of veterans, and the wrongfully convicted. Belvin Perry, Jr., one to know. Along with croquet, horseshoes, and yard darts, Badminton is a mainstay of the weekend barbecue circuit. Beyond American backyards, though, the sport is on quite a different level. In the rest of the world, high-performance badminton is actually the second most played sport in the world. In Canada, it's a popular idea. 
In California, it's also a popular idea. There's probably 40 or 50 facilities like this in California. In fact, badminton is an Olympic sport with biannual world championships played by professional athletes. Daryl Young knows that as well as anyone. I played in the Olympics in 1996 in Atlanta for Canada and reached the round of 16. And I was very happy. It was the highlight of my career and a highlight of my life, actually. <laughs> when his playing days were over, Young opened a sports center in Vancouver. Sort of felt like there's a need for this type of thing and sort of discovered that a warehouse could facilitate that. I started with a small facility with six courts. It was basically the first purpose-built badminton facility in Vancouver since the 50s. In the eastern U.S., high-performance badminton is almost non-existent. Seeing an opportunity, Young expanded his business to Central Florida a few years ago. We felt like this is kind of a, kind of a niche sport and maybe it, it might be successful here. And we decided to just jump in and then build it. <laughs> so, you know, it was really a kind of plan, but, you know, we felt like definitely there's a need. We focused initially on badminton, which some people will find somewhat unusual or surprising. And the reason to be surprising is that badminton as a sport in the United States is generally viewed as a recreational activity. Badminton is especially suited to a diverse community like Central Florida. We have many different ethnic groups that, that come and visit at our facility. There's a, a huge draw from the tourist population. We appeal to many shift workers to come and play because we're, we're open seven days a week, basically morning till night, so you can get a court any time. The Orlando Badminton community is like the United Nations. Because the U.S. marketplace, most people don't grow up playing the sport of badminton. Most of the players that are playing here have actually come from some other country. Growing any sport requires grassroots participation, and Young promotes that aspect of badminton. We've approached many private schools and, and the public school system to try to implement badminton into the school system, so they're now approaching us and having us do demonstrations at the schools. And we're getting people educated to the, the uniqueness of what badminton as a support does. I mean, one of the things that's nice about badminton is that you can start playing at the age of six and you can play to the age of 60. And it's also a sport that's size independent. So the top badminton player can be five foot seven or a top badminton player can be six foot four. Raising the sport's profile also means showing off the best of the best. The USA International is the event we're hosting. This is our third year hosting this event. The tournament this year is our strongest field ever. It's 150 to 160 competitors from 35 countries around the world, which is the largest we've ever had. And the other thing is players are vying for very, very critical points. And it's your points that'll determine whether you make it to the Olympics or not. Of the 155 players that we have playing here, probably close to 40 of them will actually make it to the Olympics. And the Olympics will only have 180 badminton players in total from around the world. 40 of them you're seeing here today. For local player Vu Long Pham, the event provided a chance to test himself against the top players in the world. This is my third year participating in the Yonex International. Overall, all these guys, they're, they're actual, actual athlete, they train their whole life. And for me, it, it was just an experience. It, there was a saying, you never lose, you either win or you learn. So I haven't won anything, but still, I learned a lot from it. Central Florida may be new to the badminton world stage, but Young and Wilson hope this area will soon be known for more than gators and citrus. We believe that we have a chance to produce world and Olympian champions here and also just to expose people to the variety and the fun of badminton as a sport. It has the biggest potential because it's the second most played sport in the world. I believe badminton is definitely going to grow in the U.S. marketplace because every time we expose a person to badminton, they go, wow, I didn't know that's what this sport was.
right, guys, I just want to welcome you all to the Bash on the Beach 3, third annual, here at Chris's Lounge. And we're going to start this match off, the super matches. It's going to get pretty intense in here, so can we have a round of applause for our first matchup? We got Cody Franklin and Tim Lewis to the table, please. It's man on man, you know what I mean? It's like, you know, it's alpha male versus alpha male. You know, the testosterone's flying, people are just, you know, insane. And, you know, to smash another guy's arm to the pin pad, it's a crazy adrenaline rush. Yeah, that's it. Craig Subelair is an arm wrestling evangelist. He's not only an arm wrestler himself, he also hosts an internet radio show on the sport and stages arm wrestling events. It's funny, in life, you run into some stuff that you're really passionate about. And when I picked up the sport of arm wrestling, a light just clicked on, man. I was a bodybuilder for over 25 years, and I thought I had passion for that, but not even close, man. I get up every day, I train, 5 o'clock in the morning if I got to work. You know, I'm constantly in the gym on my days off, constantly studying videos and tapes, and, you know, I just love the sport. <laughs> Events like this one near Ormond Beach bring Central Florida's small but growing community of arm wrestlers together. Among them is internationally ranked Chris the Freak Chandler. I started arm wrestling when I was 13. Um, I won my first state championship when I was 13 years old, my first overall title. When I was 15, I won national championships and represented Team USA at the world championships. I call myself an arm wrestler, that's what I do. I do train hard, more bodybuilding type, more gym workouts and stuff like that. My go-to practices when I can, big tournaments or even local ones to show support. One of the big matches of the day was Chandler versus Subelair. You know, he's the top arm wrestler in the country. I've been at this sport for three years, so just to be able to compete at that level, um, I'm just honored. And that's my arch enemy right there, my good friend, but you know, he's the guy that you know I train hard and that's who I like to beat some days. From Orlando, Florida, baby! We got a huge grudge match coming up with uh, Pat Downs and Josh Bishop, two great pullers. Uh, they're going to be going at it, real intense. There's been a lot of trash talking uh, on Facebook and social media. So uh, hopefully we'll keep it to the table and nothing gets too crazy. Uh, it does get intense out there. I've seen some people take swings, but for the majority, it's left on the table. And usually after the animosity gets over with, you see these guys sitting at the bar having a beer together and you know talking about their trainer, whatever. Mild-mannered 17-year-old newcomer Chant Shaw surprised a lot of people by winning several matches. It's fun to be the underdog, just walk up to the table, have to pull you know, a big strong guy and maybe sometimes get a surprising win. Uh, it's like a family atmosphere almost. Everyone's always kind to each other and you meet a lot of new people. I'm definitely going to stick with it. It's a, it's a sport, but it's also a passion, so it's addicting. He looks like some little, you know, nerdy kid out there and you get him on the table and he doesn't mess around, man. And uh, once he gets the horsepower, gets a little more confidence, I'm going to say you're going to hear that chance name quite a bit. It's all about the hand and wrist. You have to have a strong hand and wrist. That's the key to arm wrestling. And Dana with the win. At the end of the day, the heavyweight champion was crowned. Left and right hand super champion, Chris Chandler. Battle of the Beach, three time champion here. So uh, it didn't seem like anyone in the building could beat this guy tonight. So round of applause for the freak. I work really hard to be this, and there's not a lot of people that can do what we do, and especially at the level that we do. I mean, this is what people like myself and Craig Suwear and everybody lives for. This is what we do. 